You are on Strat News Global. I am Nitin Gokhale and with me uh, is a special guest joining us from Australia, Rear Admiral James Goldrick, who has uh, been a naval strategist and an acknowledged expert on maritime affairs uh, the world over, uh, a frequent visitor in the past uh, to India and an uh, India watcher, Indian Ocean watcher. Uh, Admiral Goldrick, uh, welcome to this program. Thank you, Nitin. It's great to be here. Thank you. In fact, uh, what I wanted to start off with uh, is the new uh, Australian uh, Defence and Strategic Update and the 2020 uh, Force Restructuring Plan that has been unveiled uh, recently uh, by the Australian Government. What do you make of it and uh, does it signify uh, some uh, kind of subtle change in Australia's approach uh, to defence and strategy? I think you're right to say it, it does reflect a change in our approach. It's a recognition, I think, of a changing and increasingly uncertain and competitive geostrategic environment. And it's a recognition that Australia needs to have both more independent capability and also to use it in a more independent and um, clearly identifiable as a national Australian sense. Um, there's no question that the alliance with the United States remains a central uh, pillar of Australian security and defence policy. But there's also recognition that um, given the uh, challenges that we're all facing, that Australia needs to have strategic weight and it needs to be able to use it in a way that demonstrates and contributes um, to Australia's um, protection of its interests and protection of the secure and stable uh, environment in the Indo-Pacific. And we believe that that it involves capability elements and it also involves, frankly, um, to increase our own deterrent powers uh, to have greater lethality as well as reach in the region um, so that, you know, we can say to people thus far and no further. Um, it's a stage plan. Um, it is going to take somewhat longer than I would like, um, but there's always a balance of expenditure. Uh, in these things. But I think it, it is this combination of realizing that we need to be able to do things independently in a greater, with a greater weight than we ever had before, without rejecting the idea that we have an alliance with the United States and that's critical. But I think implicit also is this idea that if we have national strategic weight and serious capability, that makes us a better partner potentially when working with other nations with similar concerns. True. Uh, and without mentioning uh, uh, as much uh, in uh, as clear terms uh, that China is right in front and center of this uh, approach, uh, changed approach, I would say, uh, without uh, actually being explicitly mentioned in the document. Uh, would you think uh, the recent uh, kind of dust up between uh, Australia and China uh, has uh, forced uh, this change a little bit? Yes, I mean, it's important to understand we, we don't want China to be an enemy and there's certainly no contradiction between uh, what Australia wants in the region and potentially the legitimate rise of China. Um, and indeed, the uh, point, you know, Australia, I think, is now exporting 48.8% uh, of our export by value and now to China in the post-COVID environment with China's um, economic resurgence. Now, that's that may be an imbalance we need to rectify. But the point is, Australia's benefited in very large measure from China's rise. And, you know, we support the idea of a strong China that's economically prosperous, that's um, both participating in and benefiting from the global system. Uh, what we are concerned about, however, is behaviours. And what we're particularly concerned about is coercive behaviours, which will change the way not only um, would, which will not only change things in the system, but will change the way the system works. And that's where we're viewing very strongly that coercive behavior needs to be responded to, um, it, you know, in a, in a balanced way, a proportionate way. Um, and so it is a recognition that there is potential for the for our regional strategic environment to change in ways we don't want that are not in our interest. We believe, in fact, they're in no one's interests. And um, frankly, I think a lot of China's behavior in recent months has actually been against China's interests. That's true. But I hope they realize that because 
from Japan to Bhutan, uh, in between India and Australia, everywhere the Chinese are actually behaving more aggressively uh, than they ever have. The belligerence is something that is uh, not really understood by people, that the reasons behind the belligerence rather. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it makes us, uh, two of us uh, really, Australia is at the receiving end of some of the aggressive behavior uh, by China and also India, as you must be watching uh, sitting there in Australia. Uh, that uh, right now the uh, the border standoff uh, is designed to intimidate and coerce India uh, into uh, perhaps you know uh, being playing second fiddle uh, to China. But uh, in that context, um, what do you make of uh, the recent uh, I would say progress in um, the Quad uh, cooperation, the four countries: uh, United States, Australia, Japan, and India in terms of uh, what they can do, uh, both uh, strategically and militarily? I think it's very encouraging. Uh, what I would say is I don't think that necessarily uh, all the cooperation has to be quad. Um, I think there's enormous potential in the bilateral and trilateral without trying to complicate things and without necessarily having all four partners brought in every time. I think it's this idea of a partnership of uh, mutual um interests and and the term values and shared values is is i think abused very considerably but i think in relation to a secure system in which coercion is not being allowed to run uh, unchecked there is an important issue of shared values and, and that fundamentally is coercion is not the way things should be ha happening so i think it's it is encouraging and i think there's a lot more to happen um but I will say, I, I just want to make that, that point that I think bilateral and trilateral can be, can be contributing to what can be a quad effect. Um, so, for instance, and I know Excise Malabar has been receiving a great deal of uh, attention in previous weeks. I'm fairly relaxed about that. That's up to India um, because, of course, Australia and India have already been engaged in very sophisticated maritime exercises on a bilateral basis. Um, you know, when you're both, when you're doing anti-submarine, practicing anti-submarine warfare, and both of you send submarines, that indicates uh, you're working at a pretty sophisticated level. And there's obviously an increasing degree of trust and understanding implicit in that. True. In fact, uh, I think the Indian Aust India Australia ties have uh, really broadened uh, in the past uh, half a decade uh, and, and more. And I think only um, uh, it's set to grow in uh, coming years. I mean, I think uh, Indian diaspora in Australia uh, is now a significant number. Uh, and uh, I think hopefully they're adding value uh, to uh, the pluralistic society in Australia. What's been your larger assessment in terms of uh, how India and Australia can perhaps cooperate bilaterally in uh, Indian Ocean as well as in South China Sea? I mean, have you looked at uh, this prospect? Um, I'd like to continue uh, the development of the maritime domain awareness efforts that have been going on. And of course, those as much apply to non-state-based threats, uh, civil maritime security, illegal fishing and all those. And, and it's good to see the cooperation, and I hope that will continue to extend. I think that uh, information exchange and intelligence exchange should become increasingly important um, the more the two of us know about what is happening in you know across the spectrum in the maritime uh, is important in terms of the south china sea i think it's this um uh, and it's really both countries have been doing this it's it's to be saying how we see the law of the sea should be interpreted mm -hmm. and it's being trying to be a constructive and frequent presence um I've, I've reminded the Chinese on more than one occasion that Australia has been a regular presence for over 100 years in the South China Sea. Um, and indeed, when we were first in the South China Sea, the Australian Navy was actually chasing Americans. True. <laughs> which leads the Chinese to go back and check their history books. Um, yes. because, for, because the recent statement that Australia made about the law about the South China Sea was really making the point, it's not about Chinese claims to particular rocks or anybody's claims to rocks. Yes. It's about the interpretation of the law of the sea because we're fundamentally opposed to this idea the South China Sea can become a closed sea and other people should be excluded. Um, so I think that 
and, and India's, you know, presence and frequent visits and so on, showing India's, I mean, India has legitimate interests. India is, you know, is just as interested in the free passage of shipping and trade and the stability of that region as anybody. It's, it's saying, it's, it's being there and saying we're here peacefully, we're here cooperating with literal powers. Um, there's nothing to say we can't cooperate with the Chinese who are a literal <laughs> power. True. Um, but we should be there. Um, and we should be there in a substantial way that can't be ignored. Great. Uh, as far as uh, India-Australia defense cooperation is, I think, the centerpiece of the, uh, uh, the broader relationship. But uh, going further, uh, what would you think uh, India and Australia and maybe uh, the United States do uh, to uh, deter uh, Chinese misadventure or uh, adventurism uh, in uh, both uh, the Indian Ocean and uh, South China Sea. Is there something that uh, you would recommend or you would think that uh, just mere presence and uh, mere passage uh, of uh, ships, the freedom of navigation patrols like the uh, Americans do uh, uh, would well, be... Yeah. One of the problems here is is terms like freedom of navigation um, because, of course, the freedom... Although what the Americans are doing, the freedom of navigation operations is really... In you know quite specific to interpretations of the law of sea in relation to passage of ships rather than claims. My concern more is this idea of the whole you know the nine dash line and the whole South China Sea that the idea that it it should be a closed sea to other powers, um, which is much more than within twelve miles of an artificial island or a reef which does generate a territorial sea and so on. So I suppose. Um, it's this business of doing more of the same. Um, in the South China Sea context, what I was talking about, having uh, frequent deployments, uh, being a presence, exercising with the literal countries, helping contribute to the literal countries who had capacity challenges uh, in developing their capacity in an appropriate and helpful way, mm -hmm. um, contributing to the maritime domain awareness, um, both in a, you know, a military sense, but also I think the maritime security sense. And I think in that way, it, both there and in other things, making it clear what we don't think is right. Consistently. Yeah. Um, you know, and it seems, you know, the behaviour, I think, um, in the um, in the disputed areas with India, you know, is, is seemed to me as an observer to be pretty appalling, whatever right. one thinks about the, the rightness of the claims. Right. Um, you know, it's it's and it's this idea of coercion you know it's what's the benefit um and so i see just just keep pushing back on what is not right constantly yes that is the it has to be a constant pushing back but let me ask you a final question you are a uh, you know a strategic watcher a strategic writer thinker uh, what do you think of the indian navy's growth uh, in the past um, few years or maybe a decade and what do you think uh, the Indian Navy needs to do more? Uh, does it need to do a little more um, projection of power? Does it need more uh, platforms? Uh, what, what What is your sense sitting in Australia? Uh, my sense is, I mean, it, it, most, it more falls to a challenge India faces. Um, and arguably Australia has, uh, both countries are historically um, maritime powers with continental preoccupations. <laughs> well put, yes. Um, you know, the joke that Australia's national anthem, which you know, says we're girt by sea, should actually, uh, the line should actually be girt by beach, which is, you know, most <laughs> Australians' idea of the sea. That's but right. in a more serious sense about India, I mean, you live in a very difficult neighbourhood. You have yes. many neighbours and a couple of them, you know, Not are really. very awkward. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm very conscious of that. But in my view, the strategic culture of India is only just beginning to encompass India's reality and its vital interests and its responsibilities as a maritime power and give the right resources to them. My view is that the Indian Navy uh, is still not receiving uh, the appropriate resources. Um, and, you know, I have no, uh, no detailed comments to make about India's force structure. In fact, I think it's a pretty capable force structure. I'm not sure it's getting the resources it needs 
to be as capable as it could be given that's the true. unit it has and the size it is. That, and, that's true. And, and I've been watching what's been happening in terms of the budgetary allocations and it doesn't look, you know, as though that direction is 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 going in in the way it should. So I suppose that's really it. I mean, one is seeing that change, one is seeing much more maritime thinking, you know, and and, over, and recognition. I think that your present government, I think, has, you know, um, been much more open about the importance of, of those things. Uh, but I think there still needs to be more follow through than there perhaps has been. True. And I think very well put and uh, even sitting uh, at a distant uh, place, you've managed to really get to the nub of the matter and uh, which I think has been uh, now expressed uh, increasingly by even Indian strategists that the Navy mm -hmm. needs uh, more, not just more resources, more teeth uh, by getting more resources because uh, that that is going to be uh, something that will deter China much more than uh, just uh, the land forces. But we will see what happens in the next uh, few years. But uh, thank you very much for your time, Admiral. Pleasure. Great to talk with you, Nitin, and thank you very much for inviting me.